All right, well, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6, if you will. John chapter 6, we're going to um, finish up uh, Jesus' uh, bread of life discourse here. So part, uh, part three, I kind of feel funny even saying something like that. If you think about it, you know, we've taken several weeks uh, to go over something that Jesus just sort of said in a, in a, in a moment. Um, in fact, everything we've been looking at has only taken place over the course of uh, a couple of days. And throughout all of uh, what's taken place, Jesus has taught some very difficult things. And we've gone very slowly. We've taken them in bite-sized chunks week after week. And you have to remember that these people were hit with this all-in-one uh, teaching. Um, if you think back all the way back to the, um, the feeding of the, the 5,000, that was a big success. They wanted to make him uh, king, his, their, their, their political uh, ruler. And Jesus did the unthinkable and rejected that offer. And that had to be shocking to his disciples, to his close followers. This would have been a big success. This is what they're looking for. And yet Jesus rejects it. Instead says, no, I want you to to leave. And he sends his disciples away, uh, confused, no doubt. They get out in the middle of the sea and a storm arises. So they're in the middle of doubt and fear and confusion. And Jesus comes walking out on the sea to them. And they willingly received him into the boat. And if you remember, it's been quite a few weeks now. We looked at that sort of contrast. Those are the true disciples in the midst of confusion, weak faith, maybe a little bit of doubt, fear. Ultimately, it was Jesus that came to them. But the crowd that was so wowed by the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 searched for Jesus the next day. They, they travel across to Capernaum and they find him. And for that For that particular group, Jesus um, said this back in uh, verse 26. Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because because you ate the loaves, right? You you saw the sign, but they didn't see the sign. They saw the miracle, but they were more concerned about what they got out of it. They didn't see the spiritual significance. And instead, he demanded their personal faith. You need to believe in, in me. And then... They asked for a sign, another miracle, and he sort of just confronted that whole faulty notion that any, another bigger or better miracle would elicit any kind of belief. And then shockingly, he stresses their human inability to gain salvation because it's ultimately a work of God. And then to top it all off, he says, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. This has been a pretty tough teaching, and we've taken it in little sections so we could digest this a little slower. Now, when you look back at these two groups of people, the the close disciples that are true disciples and maybe this crowd that are the false disciples, um, I want to reiterate, when we talk about disciples, we're talking about devoted followers of Christ because there are disciples uh, who are not believers, as this crowd would be. And as you'll see today, some of them were not really believers. But all believers are disciples, meaning devoted followers to Christ. And here we are sort of halfway through the first major section of John's gospel. If you kind of look at John's gospel in sections, you'd go up to about chapter 12. We're here ending chapter 6, and we've seen a big, a big turn. Jesus has been in opposition to the religious rulers up to this point. Now he's sort of in opposition to not just the people, but even those who would have called themselves disciples. And so here we're going to study today the reaction of the false disciples and the reaction of the true disciples to Jesus. Here, many will decide to follow him no more. So we're going to read the passage. We're going to look at verses 60 to 71, and that will finish chapter 6. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. 
From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Let's pray. God, once again, we have the privilege of hearing directly from the mouth of God to open these, this Bible and read these words. We hear the words of God, and we recognize that we need the help of your spirit to see truth and understand it, to comprehend those, tr- those truths and then apply them to our lives. God, I pray that you would go before us here. Open up our hearts and minds to what you want to teach us today. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, verse 60, we'll just start here and, and jump into it. <clears throat> Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Right off the bat, this group of uh, people are coming out saying, Well, this is really difficult stuff. Who can comprehend it? Now, Jesus has said difficult things, things that were hard to understand, to be sure. When he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, they were confused. But they're not confused here. Jesus has gone on after that to explain exactly what he was talking about. In fact, if you look at the last few verses prior uh, to this, he explains it very, uh, very, very clearly. Look at verse 55. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Remember, prior to this, they said, well, who can eat, eat, eat someone's flesh? This is this is strange. And so he's gone on, gone on to explain exactly what he's talking about. This is not like the manna that you actually ate back in the wilderness. I'm talking about something different. And as a result, they said, this is a hard saying. The word is skleros, the word hard, and it means harsh. It means offensive. It means intolerable. They're not confused This is difficult stuff you're telling us. That's harsh. That's offensive for you to say these kinds of things. Who can understand it means who can consider this or accept it. They're not confused by it. Jesus was not teaching something that's completely incomprehensible. He had made it clear. He demanded they acknowledge him as the bread of life and that they commit to him for eternal life, and it's simply more than they're willing to give. And so it's unacceptable. It's, it's offensive. And those were offensive statements then, and they are offensive statements now. Their reaction to Jesus is typical of false disciples. As long as Jesus was a source of healing, they were fine, right? As long as he would pro- provide food, deliver them from oppressors, give them what they, they wanted, they're totally fine. Christmas is approaching, and many false disciples in our world, will view Jesus only as an innocent little baby sitting in a manger. Your churches or your schools here want to see nativities put on by churches. They want to take kids to the nativity because they think it's a nice tradition that the kids should not miss out on. Churches should have a nativity. We're depriving the kids of that sweet little story about that innocent little baby that came on Christmas morn. But even if that innocent baby in a manger uh, came so innocently, they're forgetting what Scripture says about that innocent baby, even in the Gospels, right? Matthew tells us that little baby came to save his people from their sins. Where's that in the nativity? Luke tells us he came to give knowledge of salvation to his people by remission of their sins. He tells us that he came to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. What nativity would that message be included in? No, it's just a nice tradition. 
Those aren't included. Why? They're offensive. How dare you say I abide in death? How dare you say I need anything such as light? How dare you say I have sin? But Jesus demanded that of these people. He demanded that they recognize their spiritual bankruptcy, confess their sin, and trust in him alone for salvation. And what's interesting here is that Jesus sees the heart of every person as he's been so far here in the gospel, and he sees the heart of these false disciples complaining about the teaching. And look at verse um, 60, 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? <laughs> so in his omniscience, knowing the hearts of people, knowing where they were, knowing how they were receiving this, or better said, not receiving it, complaining about it, he said, does this offend you? The word is scandalizo, to take offense, or to give up believing, or to make one stumble is the word. So they were offended, and Jesus says, oh, I'm sorry, did I offend you? Was that offensive to you? And the truth of the matter is the gospel is offensive. The cross is offensive. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, I have it here for you. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, which is the same word to the Greeks foolishness. They stumble at it. In fact, both uh, Peter uh, and Paul quote Isaiah 8.14 when they tell us that uh, the cross is a, a stumbling block, that Jesus is a stumbling block. He's a rock of offense. They both say that. He's a rock of offense. And these false disciples took offense at Jesus' teaching that caused them to abandon their, their superficial faith. It wasn't real. Now, we live in a culture today <laughs> that is the offended culture of all times, I have to say. We, we, we are in the, I think, biggest, most offended culture I've ever seen. Now, I'm not that old, but, but crying out loud. In fact, if, if you don't have an offense or a grievance against someone, if you haven't been victimized in some way, you're really in the minority. You better look back in your past. You've probably been offended, and you better raise your voice about it, by golly, because you've been offended, and you better let someone know you've been offended because you're a victim. Listen, you guys, we... You want to go there. We're really all victims in some sense, if you want to look at it that way, because we've all inherited Adam's sin, okay? We are victims. We're an easily offended culture, and everyone's offended by something uh, these days. And here's the sad thing, is that the church, the church, hoping to make inroads with the, the offended majority, then, is, is watering down the gospel, and they're making it more acceptable and palatable, they don't want it to be offensive, uh, and they've jumped on the bandwagon instead of, uh, of, of the gospel, social justice issues. And the social justice issues of the day deal with those who are in the, uh, uh, the offend, offended, right? That's the, that, those are the issues of the day. Uh, so churches are holding LGBTQ plus meetings to show that they can be a, a welcoming, comforting uh, church. They're emphasizing the importance of God's love, but they leave out his righteousness. And the sin of man is downplayed. And the victory of man is praised. I don't know. A lot of churches are, are doing a lot of that. You have victory in you. You're a strong human being, right? Raise up and praise yourself. Here's what's wrong with that. The Bible is really clear in Ezekiel 18.4. Behold, all souls are mine the soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. That's what's wrong. The soul who sins shall die. Our priority should be, must be, to warn people of the truth. That truth. The soul who sins shall die. We might do a really good job of making people feel comfortable, but we will do that and we will make them comfortable all the way to the gates of hell. That's the truth. We cannot be worried about offending people. The cross of Christ is offensive. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 11, Paul says this, And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. 
I should be persecuted because I preach the gospel. But if I'm preaching and it's all about circumcision, he's saying, there's no offense in the gospel because it's about that. No, I'm not being persecuted because of I preach circumcision. Paul's being persecuted because he preaches the gospel. So note here, Jesus' approach to those who were offended at his message. And I think there's a message for all of us here. And hear me when I say, specifically, it is the gospel that should offend, not you. The gospel, the words, the message should offend, not the messenger. So let's look at his response here in verse 62. What then, if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? Jesus has offended them with his claim prior to this, that he, he came down from heaven, right? He's the bread of life that came down from heaven, the bread of heaven. And they need to eat and drink of him. And that he, would, he gave himself for the world, right? He's already said that. I've given myself uh, to you. So if I've given myself to you here and you're rejecting that, what would happen then if they, if they saw Jesus ascend back into heaven? What if I were just to ascend right back into heaven right, right now? Would those claims still offend them? Well, if we've learned anything from this passage, we should see and understand by now, yes, they still would offend them. If you learn anything from going to the book of Revelation, seeing all the things people in the end times will see, they will not be repenting to God. They will still reject the claims because it offends man and their, his wisdom. It offends man and his strength and ability. It offends man and his righteousness. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, gave a great um, set of examples of, those, of, of men that, that are examples of, 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 of human beings in those areas. And listen to what he says about those who are offended in terms of their wisdom when they are confronted with the gospel. The philosopher puts his glasses to his eyes, looks at the cross, and says, I cannot see anything so very wonderful in it. Even with these splendid glasses of mine, more than can be seen by that poor, humble peasant. I do not care about such a system of religion as that. Any simpleton can understand the cross. So he passes by and merely sneers at it. The man who loves controversy comes to the gospel and finds that there is in it pure dogmatism. <clears throat> such things are said to be true, and sinners must believe them or else be damned. I shall not do so, he says. I shall not yield implicit faith to the gospel. I like disputing upon points of doctrine. I like controverting them. I shall not listen to your preacher who says, this is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing else but the truth. I will not hear the man who speaks thus authoritatively. I like men who will give me margin enough to doubt, who let me believe what I like and no more. I prefer to use my reason and common sense. All their reason and all their common sense will, will not, it will not change even if Jesus were to ascend before their very eyes. Now, he will ascend. He will die for the sins of man, and he will ascend. But they still will not relinquish belief. They will not give in because their wisdom says no. And so Jesus has to crack through that. In verse 63, he says this, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. How does he give life? How does he do that? <clears throat> it's the Spirit who gives life. The Spirit who gives life, right? <clears throat> Jesus has been talking about some pretty difficult things here. Um, before this. Now we come to this section. He's going to hammer this down a little bit. The Spirit gives life. And in 1 Corinthians 2, 14, it says this, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. It is the Spirit who gives uh, life. Your flesh profits you nothing. That offends man's wisdom. We want to 
think that we can somehow ascend intellectually to that place of understanding God, understanding salvation, understanding our sin, our need for forgiveness. We really can't do it. The natural man does not have the ability to discern those things. You need the Spirit of God to. And this goes back to what Jesus was saying uh, earlier in John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is the Holy Spirit, ultimately, you need to reveal that truth. And without the Holy Spirit, man is utterly unable to understand Jesus' person and his works. That offends our understanding. It also offends our, our sense of strength that we should somehow be able to will ourselves there, somehow be able to ascend to some kind of place. And, and Spurgeon, if you will bear with me, once again gives us that person. The man who is relying for salvation on his own strength does not like the doctrine of the cross. If anyone preaches a gospel which tells the sinner that he has power to save himself, if he preaches a gospel which says that Christ having died to put all men in a salvable condition, they have only to exercise the power they have and they will be able to deliver themselves. If a man thus preaches something which exalts the skill and strength of the creature, he will never offend his unregenerate hearers. But, if he once begins to cast the sinner down in the dust and to teach what Christ himself taught, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And that in the scriptures all men are declared to be dead in trespasses and sins. Then the proud sinner will turn away and say, I am not going to be so insulted to have all my powers leveled to the ground. Am I to be made into a mere machine or into a piece of clay and to lie passive in a potter's hands? I will not to submit to such and indignity. It offends man's strength. I won't submit uh, to that. I'm too strong. I must push past that. But no, he says, the spirit is the one that gives life. Your flesh profits you nothing. And how does he do it? The words that I speak to your spirit, they are life. The words that I speak to your spirit, they are life. And once again, Jesus declares that salvation comes through the agency of the word of God. It's hearing these words. It's hearing the gospel. That's how he does it. You might remember a certain parable Jesus told in Luke chapter 8 about sower and the seed, right? And he goes and he casts uh, the seed and it kind of falls on some stone and falls in some thorns and falls on different types of soils. And then they're confused by it, so he explains it. Here in the parable is the explanation of the parable. And I have it for you if you can't turn there, but it's Luke 8, uh, Luke chapter 8, verses 11 to 15. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God, and those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So, the seed going out has the ability to save them. But for that particular crowd, the devil snatches it away. So they don't have ability to believe it, to be saved by it. The ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. And now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Jesus is making the point, not about the seed necessarily, not about the sower necessarily, but about the soils the, so the, the seed goes into. It's the condition of the heart. And will the heart accept, believe, receive, the word that is coming in. And other gospel writers pick up on that kind of analogy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, he says this, that we've been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Your salvation, you being born again, has come about from a seed, but not a corruptible seed, the one that dies and brings new life, but an incorruptible one. Jesus is that one. His word is that one, the word of God. In James chapter 1, verse 21, 
Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. You need the word implanted in you to save your souls. In Luke chapter 8, verse 21, but he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Jesus' own uh, family was there. And he said, no, they're not my brothers and they're not my sisters. Here's, here's, here's my family. It's those people who hear the word of God. And after hearing the word of God, something changes. You believe it, you accept it, and you begin to follow that. You live a life according to the word of God. And what is the point that Jesus is, is making here is that it's the spirit who will give you life. You cannot ascend there on your own. You can't do it. And it comes through his word. And that offends man's self-righteousness. One more example. Here's the man of self-righteousness from Charles Spurgeon. There's not a soul in all the world that by nature loves to be stripped of all merit. <laughs> we can include ourselves in that. No. The last thing a man likes to part with is his righteousness. I've known poor sinners stand on Sinai's top until their knees knock together, yet they've clung to their self-righteousness even there. I've known men stand where God's earthquakes were shaking the ground under their feet and the thunder and lightning were playing above their heads, yet they still held fast their self-righteousness. It's a hard thing to get that away from men. And then he gives the example of a Bunyan who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. You know how Bunyan says that when great heart slew giant despair, the giant had, as they say, as many lives as a cat. Well, I'm sure that self-righteousness has many more lives than that. It's the hardest thing in the world to kill. You can cut the evil weed self-righteousness up, but when you think you've got to the last root of it, it will be shooting up again before you can sharpen your knife to cut it up once more. This evil thing is bred in man's nature. When you preach against it, see how men will roar at you. They cannot bear that doctrine. What Jesus teaches here is extremely offensive. It offends our sense of merit. We somehow can earn it by good works. We somehow can achieve it through our human strength, the victory in humans. <laughs> or we can somehow attend their intellect, uh, ascend there intellectually. We can't do it. Jesus is knocking all of that down here. And then look what he says here in verses 64 and 65. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. What Jesus does here is he comes back to that tension that we've been talking about in scripture that is between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Both are there. Both are there. Look at verse 64. There are some of you who don't believe, right? That's on you. You don't believe. Jesus is blaming them. Some of you do not believe. Is he calling them to believe? Has he been telling them to believe? Absolutely. And you don't believe. But then he says, Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. In his omniscience, he knew. He knew who would be truly his. He knew there was going to be a group of them that would walk away and follow him no more. The issue here is not lack of information. This is the issue. It's lack of faith. They don't believe. The words of Jesus, just hearing them, don't accomplish anything. The claims themselves don't accomplish anything. They must be received by faith. That's man's responsibility. I hope you've seen that clear through the passage. And Jesus just demonstrates his divine knowledge of knowing who are those who believe? Yet, there's divine sovereignty here. Those who do not believe were not drawn by the Father. It just confuses our minds. But that's what he says in verse 65. And he said, therefore, I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. How do we reconcile these two things? We've already talked about this. We can't go back into it this week. But I will tell you this. You can't. If you try to, with your human wisdom, don't try, your brain will explode. You can't, you can't do it. I can't reconcile those two truths. How am I called to believe, yet cannot believe unless the Father draws me, yet I'm 
commanded to believe. In God's mind, that is not a problem in his mind. It's a problem in mine because it's, it's human. It's small, particularly mine. It's pretty, pretty small. <laughs> but it's true nonetheless because Jesus teaches it. it te- he teaches it. And what's the result here? Look at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They walked with him no more. They deserted him. They defected. And it's from that time, that means permanently abandoned Jesus. They're done with him. They wanted something that he was not willing to give. Right? Let me, let me come to you by, by my wisdom. Do, do another miracle. Let me intellectually understand that. And that's why Jesus was saying, well, what if I ascended to heaven right now? What's that going to change? It's not going to change a thing because it's not of you. You can't get there through your wisdom. You can't get there through your understanding. He's not going to give that to them. He offered them something, though, that they're not willing to receive eternal life. Both are true. Both are happening in this passage. I hope you see it. That's the reaction of the false disciples. They're offended by the message Jesus has given. I have given myself for the life of the world. You need to come and eat and drink of me because I'm the one that has life in myself. You don't have life in yourself. They reject it. Here we now see the reaction of the true disciples. Look at verse 67. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? I think something pretty amazing is happening here, by the way. This is the first occurrence of that phrase, the 12, in John's gospel. We're probably all familiar with that phrase and don't even think anything of it because we read it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The 12, the 12. Oh, yeah, we know the 12. John's never used it. He only uses it in this passage. He'll use it a couple more times. And then he doesn't use it again until the end of the book in chapter 20. Why? I actually think it's a pretty important thing. Now, think about this. You have the idea of crowds following Jesus, multitudes around Jesus, right? Disciples always around Jesus. And then many left him and walked with him no more. And then they turned to the 12. I think it gives you a stark contrast. He turned to the 12. See, by human standards, we're like, this is a big, this is a big uh, victory, right? This is a successful ministry. He's got all these crowds. Why don't you preach a message that will keep the crowds? Isn't it about the crowds? No, he turns to the 12. It's about the 12. (laughs) I hope you guys understand this too. We're all here in some part due to the faithfulness of the 12, right? I have read things that one of the 12 have written. Obviously, ultimately, it comes from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Don't run from me on that, but right? But that have changed my life. He turned to the 12. He doesn't need the crowds that have unbelief. He just needs the faithful few. John uses that, I think, in the right place. He has not wasted the use of the 12. He turns to the 12, and then he asks them, do you also want to go away? Now, think about yourself. You're, in a, you're a disciple. You're a follower of Jesus. Things are going well, lots of people, and probably some of, part of you is going, Jesus, I can, see the, I can see people fidgeting out there. They're getting uncomfortable what you're saying. Stop, stop saying that, right? And then they all go, oh, man. And then he turns to you, well, are you going to go away too? Oh, uh, well, hmm. They're faced with it, aren't they? They're faced with it. Jesus, I think, is testing their weak faith. In fact, the structure, the Greek structure of this sentence is is more like, you don't want to go away also, do you? It expects a negative answer. You don't also want to go, do you? This had to be a staggering moment for the disciples, but look at Peter's response, acting as he did in so many other occasions as the spokesman for the group. He says this in verses 68 and 69. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life also. We have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What Peter has expressed here are two key marks of true discipleship. I want to just point them out here. And I think to point them out, it's easier to go in reverse order. Look at verse 69 again, okay? Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Belief. That is faith, is it not? One of the marks of a true disciple. Jesus has been asking for belief. He's been calling for faith, personal faith, 
Peter speaking for the 12 says, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ. That's faith. What is faith? Go back over the whole teaching we've had so far. Spiritual birth, is it not? Spiritual birth. When you go back to John chapter 5, verse 25, I can put it up for you here. Jesus spoke about the, the two resurrections. He said this, most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and those who hear will live. Now, if you weren't here, just really quickly, that passage was about two resurrections. One, a resurrection of people from death to life spiritually, and one later, a resurrection of death to life physically. Here is the beginning of his teaching, and he's talking about spiritually. There's going to come a time that actually even is now is, is happening, where, where, where the dead people will hear the voice of the Son of God, and they will live. He was speaking to everyone around him, right? Before you met Christ, you were dead. You were spiritually dead. You were dead people walking. Jesus was talking to dead people walking. He said, there's a time coming, and it's even happening now, when those people will hear my voice, and when they respond to my voice, the truth of the gospel, they will have life. And that's what he's talking about here. That's faith. That's spiritual rebirth. You have spiritual life. And later on, the physical resurrection will happen to those who experience the first resurrection spiritually. And that's what he was talking about in that passage. These dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and live. And that has taken place with the disciples. The perfect tense of the Greek verbs translated have come to believe and have come to know conveys the idea of an act that has been completed in the past. That's happened. They're reborn. And when did that happen? Look at verse 68. We're going in reverse order here. But just the, first, uh, the second part of 68. Verse B, you have the words of eternal life. This is, this is how it happens in salvation order. That's why I'm going in this order. You have faith, you have belief. How'd that come? Boom. Because it responded to the words of eternal life. You've seen that in what we've been studying, right? The words of eternal life have come. They've penetrated the heart. And now we have believed. They heard the voice of the Son of God. Now they live. And because they now live through Jesus' words of eternal life, who else should they follow? Go back to 68, the first part of it. Lord, to whom shall we go? There it is. So the two marks are faith and then, Lord, who else are we going to go to? Who else are we going to follow? Faithfulness. Faith and faithfulness. It's a, not a one-time act of faith and then that's all that takes place. Faith turns into faithfulness. It's continued devotion. It's continued loyalty to Christ. I continue to follow him. Who else are we going to go to? If those guys said, yeah, we have faith, but now we're going to go follow this guy down the corner because he's got bread, <laughs> would they have faith? They wouldn't. Faith and faithfulness. The initial faith of true disciples, and get me on this, always results in continued devotion and loyalty to Christ. Not sometimes, always. And if there's not continued loyalty and devotion to Christ, the initial faith was not real. They're like the, the first group here, false disciples who turned away and walked with him no more. Do you see it? That is the truth. Faith and faithfulness. Now, we know who's in that midst of the 12. Even among the 12, not all were true disciples. And that's brought up here, right? Jesus sort of made reference to it when he said in verse 64, he knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who would betray him. I think he was talking about the bigger group that would leave, but also a specific person, and it comes out here. Look what Jesus says in verse 70 and 71. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, maybe you're sitting here going, this is random. Why is Jesus bringing this up? We just, we, we got here. We saw the two marks of, of disciples, true disciples. We saw faith. We saw faithfulness. Why are we bringing this up in here? What is going on? Why are we talking? Maybe for some people who have read the other gospel this time, they're going, well, hold on a second. We know one of those 12 isn't really a believer, right? We know one of them was Judas Iscariot. I think that's one part of it here. But I think another part of it is, has to do with Peter's response. What Peter said is, is true. They had come to believe the truth, um, but they didn't get there on their own. 
I think part of it is Peter being Peter. Do you want to go away too? Oh, not us, Jesus. I mean, we're not like those guys who didn't believe. We believe. We've heard your words. We believe. Well done, us. We've seen the truth. I'm so glad I had the great ability to see the truth, Jesus. Aren't you? Aren't you glad? You guys have that attitude sometimes, don't you? Like what you know what I'm saying? We look at the sinners of the world, those reprobates, those unregenerate. How can they live these disgusting lives? Don't they see how, how clear it is, these pathetic sinners? Do you see what I'm saying? I think Jesus is knocking Peter down a notch. We can be the ones that offend sometimes. Because we forget the truth. We um, know the truth. We, we believe. We kind of think we have it all together. And we forget that we didn't get there on our own either. It wasn't a result of our amazing ability to reason. It wasn't a result of my keen insight or my great faith. Jesus said, did I not choose you, the 12? And yet even one of you is, a, is a, a devil. One of you is literally Satan, he says. You needed the Spirit to reveal truth to you, and so did I. And I, have, I cannot be in any kind of place of superiority at all. And it should always be the gospel and only the gospel that offends. Jesus has just offended a whole crowd. They all left, but it was the truth that they were offended at. And yeah, they can take that truth and apply it to him because it came out of his mouth, but it was the truth nonetheless. But many times, I think, we come to these situations with derogatory comments, attitudes of superiority, a demeaning a manner. In fact, I'll tell you where I see it most often is in the persecution that comes to us. We get defensive. We feel harmed by the comments that were made to us. You see it most often on Facebook. Something great has been posted. It's very spiritual. It makes you feel so good. And then you go to the first comment, and you're like, that heathen, how could he say such a And you get on there, and you start this heated comments. It's, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And we get people upset at us, and rightly so, because we're approaching it as if we've come to some great place of understanding. Instead, how should we be? completely humble and contrite. If you have understood anything from this passage that we've taken weeks to go through, I hope you understand you really didn't have anything to do with it. You cannot pat yourself on the back and go to someone else and say, well, I'm sorry, you don't have the faith I have. I hope you get there one day and be as spiritual as I am. We don't say it that way, but we sure act it. It should be as humbly as we can only the gospel that offends. They can, they can choose and apply, and t- apply that to us Right, personify in you, they hate you, the messenger, because of the message you gave, that's fine. But it better be the message they really hate and not you because of your attitude and how you've delivered it. And listen, if someone persecutes you, if someone's attacking you because you're small-minded, right, those kind of things, right, you, you backwoods Christian that are believing these old fairy tales and unicorns, and it, it, we get bristled up all right away and we want to start going, well, you're going to hell, right? Listen, let the insults come. Let the insults come. I don't care what they say. Do you honestly, right? You go, oh, you know what? Honestly, I used to think the same thing. I really did. You know, I, like this has got to be rubbish. You know what? Then the Holy Spirit came and showed me that I was wrong, and it was really my pride. And I honestly, I pray the same thing for you, brother. You know, and you may not receive it. That's okay. Let it roll off. Just, you know what? Be honest and be open and say, listen, this is just the truth. I care about your soul. And you can accept it, reject it. You can say what you want about me. But don't be the one that offends. Jesus says something pretty amazing here. Didn't I choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? Now, one quick thing. I don't think Jesus is specifically referring to salvation here, right? Because, well, one of you is the devil. (laughs) All right. He did. The Satan is not elected to salvation here, clearly. He's chosen them for a particular mission. However, we're not there yet, but in John chapter 15, they're going to be in the upper room having Passover, right, having communion. Jesus will excuse Judas, the betrayer, to go do his work, 
And then in that room with those 11 remaining, he will say this, you did not choose me, but I chose and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. So he may not say it specifically there. He sure will say it later. We'll get there later. But he says, I've appointed you 11 that you're not only going to have fruit, but that fruit will remain. I will see to it that you have faith and faithfulness to the leaven. Here, however, Peter, if it's all about you and your great ability to believe and to come to know that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, listen, I chose you 12. I even chose one of you for a purpose. One of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to betray me. It's ultimately for the divine sovereign will of the father. And one of his purposes is to choose someone to betray him. Now, listen, Judas is, 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 is going to be responsible for his actions. Satan is identified as sort of the source, the power behind uh, uh, Judas and his actions, but he will still be held responsible. Even though Jesus says here, right, clearly, I've chosen one of you to, to betray me. In Matthew 26, verse 24, he says this about Judas, the son of man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Reconcile that one if you can, <laughs> right? Jesus says, I've chosen that man to betray him, but woe to that man who betrays me. Divine sovereignty, human responsibility. Here's my point in all of this, this whole passage here. We tend as Christians to make it all about us. And Peter and the disciples could be tempted to make it all about them. But with the final remarks Jesus makes here, I think he gives them a glimpse of a, of a bigger, bigger picture. That they are a very small part of a much bigger picture. Now in our eyes, we can, pretty, we can look pretty highly at the disciples, right? We can look at Peter and go, wow, Peter. But they're a small part of a much bigger picture. That means I am, I am a speck of a much bigger picture. All things are being accomplished according to the will of the Father. And ultimately, all the glory will go to the Father. And that includes praise to him for salvation. And so I want to give you the same glimpse. If you just turn to Revelation chapter 7 as a passage we'll close on. Revelation chapter 7. It's an amazing passage where you have the uh, 144,000 Jews who are sealed for salvation. We'll come to um, a great multitude in heaven in verse 9, starting there. It says this, after these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number. These are all the believers of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. If you were a believer today, you have placed your faith and trust in Christ Jesus. You continue to be faithful and trusting and loyal and devoted to him the rest of your life. You are one of them. Just get that picture in your head. Look at verse 10. And crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Please note that again. Salvation belongs to our God and to the the, the, uh, who sits on the throne and to the lamb. It doesn't belong to me. I can't pat my own back. It ultimately is part of his amazing plan. And then all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. Please keep that attitude in your hearts today. When you meet people, may your mindset be that. I can only praise God for my salvation. And brother, I'd love you to be in that multitude with me one day. You may reject it. You may hate me. You may curse me. But may the gospel be the only, only thing that offends. Don't be the one that offends them by your person, by your attitude. Be meek, be humble, be gentle, but be truthful. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for your word. And I thank you for the amazing chapter six. 
in the book of John. You have brought to us some hard and difficult to understand truths, to be sure. And Lord, we will never understand completely how these things all work together this side of eternity. We might not even care the other side of eternity. Lord, we, we do know this. You are the God who saves. And we praise you for salvation. And each and every one of us have responded to the gospel, responded to the good news, have the good news to thank, have you to thank. And I pray that we would be mindful when we interact with unbelievers, when we interact with people who have not yet been transformed and experienced spiritual birth, that we would remember we had to be transformed, that we were dead people walking, that we had nothing in and of ourselves. We have no reason to have attitudes of superiority. Help us, God. It is so hard to fight the flesh in this area, I believe. We fail in many ways. Help us to be meek and humble. Help us to be truthful and allow just your gospel, your truth to be the thing that offends, and to be meek and to be humble. Give us thick skins to absorb the insults that come, to take them with a grain of salt, to know that that is a soul desperately in need of saving. May you use us for your glory, God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.